Good afternoon. I am Emma Tubes, the executive chair for American Warriors and the, facil uh, the facilitator for the Purple Connection. This event is hosted and sponsored by Tubes Consulting, LLC. David and I are connectors, coaches, and consulting uh, consultants in Tubes Consulting, and we thank you all for being here. Welcome especially to those where this is your first Purple Connection event. For our new attendees, thank the person who invited you because they felt you might benefit and contribute by being a part of this community. And to our regulars, it's good to see you again. This is the uh, agenda for today's program. I'll be uh, doing an introduction to American Warriors and the Purple Connection, which will then be followed by our educational networking program. This is comprised of a panel um, three individuals representing three categories. We have um, the veteran military spouse entrepreneur, a military support nonprofit or community organization, a military friendly company. After the panel program, we'll have a Q&A period. And then I will follow that with some transition tips and then um, start wrapping up the event with ways to get involved and some future announcements for events. All right, so for the introduction, uh, American Warriors is a special interest group of the ACA Business Club, which is a private club with the philosophy that business flows out of relationships. People will do business with those that they know, like, and trust. Thus, members are committed to creating solid connections by learning and practicing the fundamentals of strategic networking and relationship building. American Warriors are then club members who have an affinity with or support those who have served our country in military or public service. The mission statement for American Warriors is to provide educational and networking opportunities for patriotic citizens who are leaders in business, and we support the transition into private and public sector business of active duty service members and first responders. The Purple Connection is one vehicle that the American Warriors Interest Group fulfills its mission. So the challenges of transitioning from the military is a very well-researched problem. It's evident by the multitude of military support nonprofits and community organizations that provide services to address them. Driving Community Impact was a white paper that was published in April of 2015 by the Institute for Veterans and Military Families of Syracuse University. They determined after several years of research and thousands of surveys that the leading gap in services was not that there was a lack of them, but that there was a lack of connectedness of the services and support. Very often, transitioning military will feel a loss of purpose. They may feel isolated or misunderstood, or they feel overwhelmed for the need of help, but are disconnected or lack affinity to the people and the culture of their new environment. So how do you solve it? You create a partnership of stakeholders who have a common goal for supporting American warriors. The Purple Connection is a community of partnered stakeholders with a common focus of service, support, and care so that we can effectively address the challenges of transition. So what is up with the name? There's actually two reasons for it. In government jargon, the color for joint is purple. When our military is operating overseas on a deployment, that environment is comprised of a multitude of seemingly disparate entities with varying purposes, but they each have a common purpose through the operation that unites and focuses their effort. TPC is an attempt to replicate this type of joint environment to support the American warrior in transition. Another reason is that when you combine the colors of red and blue, you get the color purple. In the Purple Connection, we're facilitating the connection of individuals who identify more closely to either the military community or the military support and business community. And when they come together, it's a Purple Connection. Here are the vision and mission of the Purple Connection. We create awareness to enable access and then enable action through collaboration and encouragement to expedite reintegration, support growth and healing, and enable opportunities. 
We do this by regularly bringing together community experts and facilitating connections through educational networking. Here are the rules of engagement for our panel program and networking. Each participant will have eight minutes to deliver their remarks. I will be using a timer and the time can be stopped short or given back for Q&A specific to that individual or used up entirely by the panelist. However, when the timer does go off, please wrap up and we'll move on to the next presenter. Once each presenter has spoken, there'll be 15 minutes for Q&A with the community. If you're uncomfortable with public speaking or want to remain anonymous with your question, you can put your question in either private or public chat and I can ask it for you. Questions are not limited to the topic of the day, which today is senior care services, but take advantage of the expertise that we have available in our panelists this month. Please be succinct in your questions and direct them to a specific panelist or the community if it's a more general transition question. If you have a complicated question, you may ask it to discover if there's a subject matter expert in the audience. Um, if, but if it's gonna take a little longer than a couple of minutes to address it, then I would suggest that you follow up after the program. After the q and I'll present uh, Transition Tips, which is, is, is um, an educational segment for paradigm or process shifts um, or a recommendation to resources that apply to the topic of the day. After the presentations, if you haven't already, use the chat channel to share your contact information, how you serve or need support from the community. The chat will be saved and then shared to all attendees uh, in a future email, and then you can follow up with each other as you like. I will do event announcements and then wrap up the event. All right, so our first presenter is our veteran entrepreneur, uh, Patrick Kershaw is a Navy veteran. He is an elder care consultant at Senior Care Authority, KCMO. He'll share a bit of a story to becoming an, entrep an entrepreneur and then inform us of his business. Patrick, up, oh, you're muted. Let me start the timer. All right, you can okay. start. Well, I'm gonna share my business first and then we'll, hopefully I'm not in all the wrong orders. Uh, so I'm Patrick Kershaw. I'm with Senior Care Authority. My wife and I are now elder care advisors, although she was a, an RN for 35 or 40 years, and I've been um, a Navy engineer, a, um, a civilian software engineer, software engineer, in, uh, uh, or not a software engineer, but a, a thermodynamics engineer and ultimately a field construction guy. Um, so... We help families typically age 40 to 60 who are caring for their aging loved ones, typically age 70 to 90. That might be aging in place, or it might be finding the right place to age um, where they can thrive and not just survive from day to day. These families um, are typically, it's their first exposure because they're less than 65 to Medicare. And then they have parts A, B, C, and D, difference between Medicare and Medicaid, um, home health care, home care, independent senior living, assisted living, memory care, um, long-term care, um, powers of attorney, conservatorships, guardianships, uh, transfer of wealth, qualifying for VA and attendance or Medicaid, selling an estate or household, moving to a senior community. Um, it's just a myriad of stuff and it comes at these families from all sides. Now, if you deal in, in the senior community, all of this, all everything I said is absolute child's play probably, but if you are not, uh, it can be overwhelming. And so we can really, really reduce the stress on a family that's working in there. Um, the other part about that is we're compensated uh, for most of the cases by the community so we don't have to charge the family. We also do some things like peace of mind visits and patient advocacy where we work directly for the families. Uh, but for the most part, the, the communities compensate us. So um, as far as our business goes, we're always interested in meeting medical community peeps, uh, particularly uh, uh, geriatricians, gerontologists, case managers, so, um, and um, social workers, that sort of thing. And then other, other um, 
things like hospice care, home care, home health, uh, people of that nature. Um, and also, of course, the families who are stressed out and looking for help. So I'm a submariner, uh, nine years active duty, fast attacks for the most part. I did one stupid patrol on a Hide with Pride boat and uh, decided that uh, that wasn't for me. So I was on USS Tunney, um, which is a um, uh, old uh, sturgeon long haul for those of you guys who are familiar with them. And particularly at the time, the sneakiest boat in the Navy. Um, the, uh, ultimately, the uh, 688s got to be almost as good as we are. They're certainly quieter than we were, but they weren't as cool as we were. Um, in the reserves, I was part of Naval Coastal Warfare. Uh, and in this, we, we protect deep water ports. Initially, uh, we were protecting uh, uh, basically if, if a Trident or, a, or even an SSN that goes and tries to do a refit in a foreign port, we would fly away and protect them while they're doing that refit. But after the uh, uh, coal incident, um, everybody wanted our services. And then we had forward deployed boats and our community, uh, and this is a reserve community, essentially deploying about every 18 months for about six months. Um, and then with the advent of 9-11, uh, we went into the crazy rotation. Um, I was a, a newly, newly minted 06 qualified force security officer when they converted all of the major commands for me to active duty, except for three. And so uh, it kind of ended my career path right there. Um, and uh, so then I moved over to ComNav Forces Korea. Uh, retired after 30 years um, and as a captain, 06 for you non-Navy types. And uh, so let's talk about being a veteran-owned business. One is to use your veterans' education benefits um, as soon as possible. If not as soon as possible, Make sure you understand those benefits, and particularly uh, if there's any time windows that are associated with them. And I'll give you an example is that uh, I didn't expect to use my, uh, um, it just doesn't impact my personal education, but I intended to transfer my GI, 9-11 um, GI Bill to my daughters. Uh, it turns out that if you don't have three years of obligated service or can't commit to three years of obligated service, you can't transfer it. Mm -hmm. And I got into this with about two years, with 28 years in, knowing that unless I made Admiral, I wasn't going to uh, be able to transfer those educational benefits to my kids. So that was a pain in the butt. Um, but anyway, understand it. There may be um, use windows, windows associated with the Montgomery GI Bill and all of that stuff. Um, try and uh, get an understanding of that. Um, and I know most of the guys on here right now, uh, it's probably too late for you if you hadn't, don't know already. But uh, hopefully uh, this video will uh, be seen by some of, the, uh, some of the peeps out there in the fleet. So uh, use the skills you obtain in the service. That's a pretty self-explanatory. Technical skills, organizational skills, maintenance, leadership. Military retirement, of course, gives you a lot of flexibility if you're trying to start your own business, and that's kind of cool. Um, we approach starting a franchise. It's because of tried and true business model. Uh, if you're looking to be your own boss, make sure the franchisor is not a boss and is a franchisor. Um, assistance getting the business up and running is great. Mutual support from other franchises was good. Support with social media can campaigns, those that kind of stuff was really good because we are in a franchise and not just a uh, uh, our own business. Um, using a franchise broker, uh, we used a franchise broker, and if you want to just get into a straight up small business, you can use a small business broker. They have an inventory of small of businesses which may meet your profile. Don't let them talk you into something you don't you won't love just because it brings in money. Kick the tires, make them earn their business. We made them set up interviews, do demographic studies, cost comparisons and other stuff like that. We called other people in the in the business to find out if it's something you can do. I've got a great example, but I only have 47 seconds. Um, and it needs to feel right. Don't do people uh, business with people who have no honor. If they skirt the rules to your benefit, they will probably skirt the rules to your detriment. And if you don't 
uh, want uh, to be second guessing the vote motivations of your franchise or other franchisees, make sure you understand that before you get involved with them. And then uh, make sure the adjacent franchise territory is well defined and procedures for pr uh, territorial collisions are defined in advance. 14 seconds to uh, tell you that Tina and I wanted to uh, start a uh, residential care home and sort of a bed and breakfast feel for seniors. We found out that maintaining, you know, as we start asking around, I see your timer. And uh, we found out that uh, after asking around that um, maintaining employee staff at the CNA level and help staff level is a constant pain for my friends who are in that business. And so we decided that instead of starting that, we went into the business that we did, still in the same sphere, but uh, definitely avoiding the problems of trying to keep uh, CNA staff employed. Um, that's all I got. You're muted. <laughs> I usually am the one saying that. Okay, <laughs> well, very good. Thank you so much for that. That was great information. We learned a little bit about your story in becoming an entrepreneur. All right, so our next uh, presenter is um, our community organization. Ted Morrissey is a membership growth consultant for Dedicated Senior Medical Center. He will inform us of who they serve and what they offer in their services. Ted, you are up. With thank minutes. you, Emma, and thank you, Patrick. I can echo many of the things that that you, that you said. Um, my name is Ted Morrissey. I'm a membership growth consultant with Dedicated Senior Medical Center. Dedicated Senior Medical Center is a physician's clinic, um, and we serve specifically seniors, uh, 55 and over. Now, uh, Dedicated Senior Medical Center was created back in, uh, well, I'll tell you the story. Our founder back in 1982 was diagnosed with cancer and he was given eight weeks to live. But he could not get a follow-up appointment for six weeks. Um, he was just, just uh, appalled by this. And, and in, in his mind, well, I might be dead in six weeks. Um, and so he was, he was a physician, an internal medicine physician, and he reached out to a friend of his who was an oncologist and said, would you please take me on as a patient? I need your help. The friend said, absolutely. Um, and uh, they, did the, they looked into his situation and they said, uh, look, yeah, you'll die in eight weeks, but this is treatable. We can prevent this. And they began treatment immediately. This was 1982. He is the head of our organization today. Um, and, and he was so frustrated though, because he thought, my gosh, me, a physician couldn't get out and get in except for uh, six weeks. What about an average individual? And he did some research on it and this was not rare at all. Uh, it's difficult to get an appointment, uh, you know, immediately, even in, in the case of a, of a term, terminal illness. Um, he investigated further and he found that seniors are more apt to have this happen than anybody. And so he made it a mission. Uh, his mission was to create a medical clinic that was specific, that would cater specifically to seniors. The mission was to honor seniors with affordable VIP care that delivers better health. Today, we have 104 mission, 104 mission, excuse me, 104 centers in the United States. We're building 10 to 20 a year. Uh, we just opened up our first center in, uh, in Missouri. Uh, it is not just a stone's throw from uh, the VA Medical Center in Missouri, uh, Kansas City. And uh, so what we do, and when he talks about VIP service, what does VIP service look like? VIP service would be if you do not have transportation, we send a car to pick you up and bring you to your appointment. We send in and also take you back home. If, um, if you're in a wheelchair, we have special transportation for that. And we do not send out a bus, we send a, a ride specifically for you. Um, 
One of the other things, and I'll use myself as an example, it wasn't that long ago that I woke up sick on a Monday morning and called my doctor and I said, I'm sick, I need to get in. And they said, we can get you in on Wednesday. I, just, I thought I'm sick now. Uh, they said, you'll have to go to an urgent care or an emergency room. Uh, in our case at Dedicated Senior Medical Center, we, uh, if you call us and you say, I'm, I'm not feeling well, we will immediately send a car to get you and bring you in. One of the most important things is that our primary care physicians, and we do have, by the way, specialists, um, because we're brand new here, uh, our center is new. Uh, we don't have all of our specialists on board, but we will have cardiologists as well as primary physicians, podiatrists, we're even gonna have an acu acupuncturist on staff. But the quarterback of the entire team is the primary care physician. A card to a cardiologist, you're just a heart. To your primary care physician, it's all of you. It's the whole body, mind and body. That person, whether it be male or female, is the one that collaborates with the specialists. When a spe when he refer he or she refers you to a specialist, they consult with each other and come up with a plan for your total care. That way, the left hand knows what the right hand is doing. I got tired of telling my primary care doctor what my specialist was doing. Shouldn't they all be on a team? Well, with us, they are. Now, in regard to veterans, I run into many veterans that say, oh, well, I get my care from the VA. That's fine and dandy. But I do run into veterans who say, I wish I had my own doctor, my own primary care physician, I, or I could pick my own primary care physician. Um, and there is a possibility of being able to do that. A lot of veterans don't realize that you can still be on, still go to the VA, still be on veterans benefits and have a Medicare Advantage plan. Medicare Advantage plans are free. Uh, in fact, uh, Humana, I do know, has an honors plan. The honors plan allows a veteran to go to a private doctor um, of their choice, uh, to receive care, but also there are additional benefits. Right now, the honors plan gives $50 a month back to your social security, a refund back to you, to your social security of $50 a month. Come 2023, January, that will be $100 a month. So there's a $1,200 a month benefit and it costs nothing to be a part of it. There are additional benefits too. I am not a Medicare specialist, and so I don't want to go out of my, my lane, so to speak. Um, but what, what I do do is I am kind of the quarterback in regard to benefits. Um, I help you get help uh, veterans get the care that they need, but I also put them in contact with Medicare specialists who can help put them on a plan that works in collaboration with their veterans benefits. My biggest ask of people is I need to get in front of veterans to let them know about this because it just isn't out there. It isn't known by very many people. I work with the American Legion over on 40 Highway in, uh, in Independence. Um, I assist uh, with their food pantry. They're one of the few American Legions that have a food pantry, but I try to uh, get to as many people as I can. But my ask for you would be help me get in front of more veterans so I can share this message and get it out. There's tremendous benefit there. It's just that very few veterans do know about it. Um, I do have my contact information uh, there in the, uh, in the chat section. Um, my number is 816-520-4544. My email address is ted.morrissey at dedicated.care. Last thing I wanna say is, and this is very special and I love our doctors for this. Our doctors, our patients have access to their doctor 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our doctors give them their personal cell phone number. And they say, if you ever have a problem, if you ever are concerned about something with your health and you need to get a hold of me, you call me. Our doctor last month uh, was at uh, on vacation in Wisconsin, and one of my one of my patients, because I'm an advocate to certain patients, so one of my patients contacted me, and I said, 
call the doctor. Here's his number. And, and she says, oh, yes, I have it. She called him on vacation and he was more than willing to help her out and did a very good job. All right. Very good. Thank you so much for that information, Ted. That was really great. Um, and you're right. It is probably a, um, a unaccessed resource because of just people not being aware of it. All right. Very good. Our next presenter is our uh, military friendly company. So um, Eva Gavin is a military academy mom and a senior care advisor also with Senior Care Authority. Patrick and Eva both own their businesses, but they work collaboratively within the network of support and services. Eva will share with us how she's military friendly with her work, events, and activities. Eva, you're up. Hi. So yes, I am a West Point mom. Very proud. Uh, Isaiah is studying cybersecurity, specifically drones. And um, he is a yuck this year. And uh, last week was branch week. And I texted him, I said, how was branch week? Because we just don't hear from him a whole lot. But he said, fantastic. I love the army. That was his like four word reply. So um, I'm very happy that he is exactly where he wants to be. So, um, so to piggyback on what Patrick was saying is, you know, basically where we come in is when somebody has a loved one that can no longer uh, live at home alone, we might, that might be pointing them to resources, you know, to help them stay at home longer or helping them sort through all the confusion of the different living options, how we can finance it, what's in your, you know, what you can afford, trying to help you get the biggest bang for your buck. Um, but um, like Patrick and Tina, um, we got into this because we went through it with our own families. And I wanted to be, I mean, you just don't know what you don't know is a lot of the problem. Uh, the other thing is, is proximity to our loved ones. So maybe you're obviously not a senior thinking, oh, I'm going to need either Patrick to help me out myself. But almost all of us have family members that we could probably use this service for. And uh, we have a lot of clients that when you're in the Kansas City area, I think it's probably not a unique situation. My dad was a farmer and he was going to farm till the day he died. He pretty much did that. Um, you know, a lot of people are either north of the river and they're not, not moving south or they're definitely Missouri or definitely Kansas and they're not moving, you know, and I've got clients in New Jersey and Dallas and San Diego uh, where they, their parents are not leaving Kansas City and um, these families just need boots on the ground to try to help them sort through the options or, you know, maybe they can fly in for a couple days to help out their family member. And um, we need to pack as much figuring out what to do with them in those two days as possible. Um, we sort of work as just a central point of helping people point them to all the different resources that are available. You know, specifically in the military situation, I've, I'm running into a lot more in the baby boomers where I like to call them um, elder orphans. Um, where maybe the wife has died and they literally have no one. And it's, um, it's kind of a sad situation. Um, so, you know, I just try to be that person that can help them sort through. We work with a lot of, with discharge planners so we can, you know, help them instead of just discharge planners, social workers are so overworked and we can kind of give that concierge VIP service, you know, to these, um, to these loved ones, um, it's sometimes people just need to talk for 45 minutes while they're driving home about their loved one and caring for their loved one. And I can just help them sort of see a clear path of what their next steps are. Um, there's an extremely high incidence of Alzheimer's in veterans. Um, so that is definitely Alzheimer's is something our group, all of us is, is very heavily involved in. And I did put the information about our Alzheimer's event next week, but in general, Alzheimer's, you know, is, is just affecting all of us. It's, it's a really big deal. So, um, but I feel like Patrick and Tina and I, and, you know, we're all in it for the right reasons. And there's a lot of what we do too, is also helping 
um, people avoid scams because there is just rampant out there right now. You know, just to kind of be that one on one, like help people sort through the maze of all these next choices is something we pride ourselves on, on trying to be the best that we can for these people. So, and once again, it's mostly paid for. Um, so it's typically a free service. Um, and sometimes when they're doing a Medicaid spend down, we have, we have to charge a fee because we can't get paid by Medicaid, but um, mostly it's usually a free service. Okay, well, you have three whole minutes still left in your in your eight minutes. I do, okay. Yeah. Um, well, I can tell you about a really challenging one I've worked with just recently. Okay. I've got a veteran who is um, an addict, has had a couple strokes, is only 66, and um, alcoholic and opioid, uh, trying to figure out how to get them walking again. Um, if you're trying to find a skilled situation, first of all, I, I wanted them in a place that, um, you know, he wasn't around like 80, 90 year olds. Um, second of all, if you're trying to go into a skilled nursing um, community, they won't take people with addiction. It's, you know, I'm sure it's a liability issue, right? So they don't want anybody with addiction. If you're trying to get somebody into a clean and sober place, um, they can't handle anybody who can't walk or bathe or get themselves to the bathroom. You know, this person had had a couple of strokes, um, but has the potential to get back in gear. And, you know, the depression, they have underlying depression, hit the pandemic, kind of spiraled, uh, spouse died, and, you know, just trying to find um, somebody who would take all of that you know, um, ended up having to go kind of rural into Cass County to um, find them the resources of somebody who would just take them, you know, but I basically spent a whole day on the phone just sorting through all their different options. And people were like, oh, try them, try them. Oh, no, we can't take them, but try them, you know, and it'll be a situation where oh, I ha you have to call every morning at 10 a.m. to see if there's a spot. I mean, it can, there's so many hurdles, you know, to being able to, to get to the resources. And um, I think we're on the right path. We got them in the hospital for three days. So we got them qualified for their um, hundred days at a rehab that, you um, is gonna was willing to take them even though they had substance abuse issues and try to get this person back walking in again and some mental health issues you know um counseling um so but boy it was it it has been uh flips and cartwheels and hoops to jump through to try to find all the different resources for this for this client of mine it's but that's what we do, right? That's what we do is try to sort through all that. I mean, you can spend all day on the phone and, and people, there's so many problems with people who are working that are actually at their job, but they call it like presenteeism, right? Where you're at work, but you're dealing with all the issues of your parent, you know, trying to sort out their care, sort out their living, you know, and, um, you know, we can come in and kind of take all that off your plate so that you can just focus on your family and, and um, your job. All right, very good. You're down to 10 seconds. So you used it all up. Awesome, good job. All right, so that is our panel program. And um, thank you, Eva. That was a great story um, as far as just kind of being able to visualize exactly how your service is delivered. And uh, so what we're gonna do next is the Q&A period. So the Q&A period is uh, 15 minutes long. And this is just open to questions of our panelists to maybe clarify on um, what they offer, um, maybe anything else as far as um, any type of other transition type uh, questions that may be more general in nature. But we will have that as kind of an open um, opportunity to ask questions. And then, um, and then we'll move on to the next part of the event um, after that. So 15 minutes for a Q&A. Who has a question? I have a question for Ted. Uh, did, I, did I hear you correctly that Medicare 
Advantage plans are no cost for veterans. The Medicare Advantage plans that I'm referring to are no cost to anyone. Um, but what I'm saying is that uh, that it, yeah, it is it is no cost. Uh, the Medi Medicare Advantage Advantage plans that that we work with. Um, so yeah, they're no cost to anyone. Um, and the great thing about it is now we do not charge for our services. I mean, there are no co-pays or anything like that, as long as you have a Medicare Advantage plan. Medicare Advantage plans may and, and usually do have a copay if you were to go and see a specialist. Usually it's a $25 copay or something like that to see a, see a specialist. But uh, as far as the premium, uh, there are zero premium plans out there that are just phenomenal. And they're getting better every year. So there's no there's no means testing or anything with those. No. Wow. Okay. Thanks. And please understand, I am not a Medicare specialist, but um, yeah, there's no means testing for a Medicare Advantage. Now, Medicare supplement plan, yes, there would be means testing, but that's a that's a totally different thing, or a Medigap plan, you would call it. There is means testing for those. Medicare Advantage, no. You can be you can be terminal and and you can you can get one at no cost right. and the supplemental plans are also going to be underwritten based on your health so. absolutely absolutely and you still have the age requirement of 65 now right yeah 60 uh 65 or disabled uh, you could be a dual eligible with uh disability or you could be a, a dual eligible based on being on medicaid um so then, then it would be 55 and over if we're talking about someone who is either disabled on social security disability or is on, uh, on Medicaid. Okay, yeah, I was just gonna ask about whether or not social uh, security disability um, would be something that could be used as a payment. Um, could you clarify as far as the access? So it's a, it's a medical center so it's not like a clinic where you can just walk off the, the street it really, into it. Do you have to get a referral as far no, as uh, we are, a practitioner? We are, we are a primary physician's clinic, uh, but we do not take, uh, we do not, uh, it's not like an urgent care where you can just come off the street and we've never seen you before and we'll treat you. Mm -hmm. You need to be an established patient. What that okay. means is what I do is, is I take people, people that are interested I'll have them come see me or I'll pick them up, have them picked up. I'll show them around. I'll take them on a tour, introduce them to a doctor, introduce them to our staff, explain exactly what we do and, uh, and uh, give them fi the finer points of, of our center and then sit down with them. And, and they, some of them, they say, Oh, I want to be a part of this. I say, okay, let's sign you up. And that's when I go through the HIPAA things. I have to get some signatures, permission to get medical records and that kind of thing. But then they are, they become one of our patients, and uh, we can see them on a regular basis. So it's like a medical community where they do, is the community of as far as the the doctors do they have a primary care provider within the center that is their usual, or is it like their a primary care based doctor based on whatever their uh, medical needs are? They have access to the various. Uh, uh, they would have we that. would have to be their primary care doctor and mm -hmm. believe me our doctors are phenomenal um our doctors have left have left uh traditional medicine to come to us because our our the doctor i was just talking to the other day he says look i had three thousand patients when i was at advent health mm -hmm. he said three thousand patients i couldn't see a patient i had to, i could only spend five minutes with a patient he said, I come here, our doctors max their patient panel out at 450 patients apiece. So he says, I can spend 20 to 30 minutes just visiting with a patient. He said, that's why I got into medicine. Right. So one of the things I was wondering, Ted, is um, I have a number of friends who are, were previously now retired, um, you know, private practice doctors, but there was so much pressure on them to go into 
hospital settings rather than the private practice. I'm wondering if what you guys are providing is sort of the answer um, to those doctors who really kind of want a more uh, intimate. If you have a physician who wants to a more intimate situation, please have them call me. We are hiring doctors. Please have them call me. Um, our doctor said it was a lifesaver. He spent 15 years with 3,000 patients, and it's, a, it's an assembly line. The more patients you see, the more money you make. Our money is made by keeping patients well. And what I mean by that is if, you go to, if you're a patient of ours and you go to the hospital, we have to reimburse Medicare for the cost of your care because we apparently didn't do a good job of keeping you well. Yeah. But so, Medicare um, pays us well to keep you well. So, uh, Ted, one other thing, you know, you brought up the uh, Medicare Advantage plans. One of the things that we run into uh, with our families who have Medicare Advantage is now we have to worry about whether the community accepts the Medicare Advantage plan that they have. Um, and TRICARE is another one, you know, um, uh, whether they accept TRICARE. So uh, one, do you guys, and can you describe, discuss a little bit about the barriers there? There are barriers. Uh, you know, some people have some, uh, uh, and I don't want to mention the names of the, of the, the coverages, the companies. Um, I don't want to bash them, but there are some that aren't as well known. Now, I will say you've got your Aetnas and you, your Humanas who are pretty much accepted by, by everyone um, and are certainly accepted by us. Um, but we do not accept, for example, TRICARE, and, mo and, and a lot of places don't. Um, that's why I encourage people to have a Medicare Advantage plan, because there are, but now there are certain, me certain Medicare Advantage plans that work well in conjunction with TRICARE, for an example. The one thing I will say, though, is you still need to get your medications from the VA, Medications would come from the VA, but your care can come from our private physicians. I don't know if that answered any of you, what you're asking, Patrick, but yep. but yeah, Humana, I, I love Humana and I love Humana's plans for uh, uh, for veterans. Uh, they have they have, are really working hard to offer benefits to our veterans and, and they are certainly my favorite. They are certainly my favorite. And by the way, I work with all kinds of Medicare specialists, whether it's whether it's Aetna or Humana or Cigna or whoever it is. Um, so I refer people to them because I trust them and they have loads of talent and I'm very familiar with them. And my patients have been extremely pleased with the group of people that I work with. Do you, do you bill like do you bill Medicare like a normal doctor's office and or you don't deal with Tricare or Tricare for Life, but also private health insurance companies outside of the the Advantage plans? Uh, the Advantage plans are the only ones that uh, they, it, they we're unique in that Advantage pays us a certain amount of money every month to treat a patient. Okay. Um, they have an idea. Uh, you know, they have, they know the numbers through actuarials and everything. They know how many, how much they spend per individual per year for care. They know that we do a better job of keeping them healthy. So they pay us, they pay us a fraction of what they would normally pay per year for hospitalizations and everything like that. The catch for us is if we don't do well, we end up paying or reimbursing Medicare for the cost of their hospital bill. And that can be in the millions, you know, if, if you have a heart problem or something. And so we're very good at what we do. Our patients live five years longer than the national average. Our patients are 52% less likely to go to an emergency room, 44% less likely to have a hospital stay. So if I'm covered by private health insurance, you would bill them as well? Pardon? If I'm covered with a, by a private health insurance company, you would bill them as well? If if it is a Medicare Advantage plan, but no, not private health care. Okay. So, so I saw Joseph's question down there. Um, so many retirees have TRICARE Prime or TRICARE. 
for retirees is this limited factor. It is a limiting factor. Um, and I can give you an example is that, um, so I've been with the VA because of my disabilities, um, but my family, we were part of a medical health share. And through that, they can go to whatever doctor uh, is, most doctors that away. But um, when I turned 60, we all went on to TRICARE Prime and not all of my kids' doctors took TRICARE. And so we ended up in a doctor shopping thing at that point. Um, if we wanted to go to, um, you know, Archwell or some of the other places, we, we couldn't because they don't accept TRICARE. You have to, you do have to shop it. Um, and that's, that's really the biggest thing. And same thing that I find with, if I have someone who comes to me with um, Medicare Advantage that is, say, United Health, not every place is going to take it. Um, and so I have to make sure that if I'm placing them at a facility, particularly long-term care facilities where I'm hoping to get um, Medicare Part B physical therapy or occupational therapy, I have to make sure that they are within that network. Otherwise, they have to do outpatient, and that's very embarrassing for us. I have a question as far as the the cost of your consultation. So both uh, Eva and Patrick, um, you you said that for the most part, your services are paid for by the communities that you are um, referring them to. So has there is there occasion to where where you find out that the individual has access to to um, uh, maybe a veteran's home that that kind of gets uncovered <clears throat> in covered in in the process of working through their their issues and um, and things that need to be addressed to where the facility that they end up with is something like um, an entitlement benefit to where do you still get compensated? Well, in some cases, the communities cannot compensate us, uh, particularly with uh, oftentimes we're working with long-term care facilities. Any facility that's um, accepting Medicare probably can't pay us a referral fee. And so for that, and, and right up front, we tell the family that for um, help placement in a long-term care facility, um, we charge a flat flat rate. And I'll tell you, it's $950, which is about one third of what it is in most places in the country. My other franchisors think that Eva and I are nuts. and uh, But uh, that's where it is. Now, say that we're working with somebody and they end up going to an assisted living facility that may not um, may not uh, be able to compensate us. A lot of times we're just, we're working those pro bono. Um, I'd say about at least a fifth of the work that we do is pro bono. Uh, per if they're already Medicaid, they're probably pro bono. Um, and, uh, but we try to help everybody. Um, it, uh, probably if we were more, you know, more of jerks or something or other, we just say, you're Medicaid, we're not talking to you, but we can't do it. We can't make ourselves do that. Okay. All right. You know, I think Patrick and I, I mean, I told my husband the other day, even if we won the big old lottery, right, which we didn't buy tickets for, I would do this anyway. Like you get so much. I mean, we do a lot of pro bono stuff and uh, we are definitely going to point our whoever we are to the very best thing that fits for them, regardless of you know, how much money we're going to make off of it. So that's just yeah, absolutely. a part of the integrity of why I you know, why it's been great for us to work together as a team. We have this right. same. Yeah, reason. you're in it for the right reason, as yeah. you both stated. The cool part about that is the majority of people we meet in this industry are in it for the right reasons. Right. So our esteemed competitors, we don't like losing business to them, but we root for them because someday we hope that instead of 15% of the time when people need our services, they come to us. Um, it's 90%, like a realtor. If you're going to buy a house, 95% chance you're going to talk to a realtor. Right, right now, if you're going to go into assisted living, about 15% chance you're going to talk to Eva or me. Nice. Okay, very good. That concludes our Q&A period. We've got three seconds left in the 15 minutes. 
So we will go ahead and move on to the next part of our program. Thank you everybody for your contribution to the Q&A period with a question or response. Um, that was very, very helpful. All right, so the next thing we're going to be doing is the transition tips. So TUS Consulting is focused on supporting students and adults in life school career or business transitions. However, in this segment of the program, I'm not gonna talk about our business, but provide transition tips pertaining to the topic of the day, which is senior care services. So um, the tips that I'm gonna be providing will be just some insights or perspective regarding paradigm shifts pertaining to senior care services. So as you've heard from our presenters, there's a whole myriad list of what senior care services include. And generally, it, you know, the intended client of a senior care um, provider is a senior, you know, or family members who have a senior needing care. But the paradigm shift that today's transition tips is meant to create is to understand that senior care like services are sometimes needed for people who are not seniors. So what do I mean by this? Okay, on the left side of this slide is the 10 signs of dementia. Um, the text is really, really small, so I'm gonna tell you what it says. Poor or decreased judgment, difficulty doing familiar tasks, problems miscommunicating, or problems communicating, misplacing things, forgetfulness that affects day-to-day -day functions, withdrawal from work or social activities, confusion of time and place, changes in personality, change in mood or behavior, and difficulty planning or solving problems. Now, dementia is something that we normally associate with senior citizens. However, in the right figure, it shows that dementia is one of five long-term symptoms of TBI. TBI and MTBI injuries are cumulative in their effects on a person and can lead to a higher or earlier onset of dementia and other health concerns later in life for those who have been injured this way. So what is TBI? Okay, some of you in the audience may recognize what this is. It stands for traumatic brain injury. TBI and MTBI, the M stands for minor traumatic brain injury. This is actually common in our military service men and women or veterans who have been exposed to injury caused by explosions, bombs, or blows to the head. So a common example of an MTBI that a lot of folks may not even realize is one is a concussion. A more serious example of an MTBI might be blacking out and losing consciousness due to a direct blow to the head. A TBI might include a physical injury that penetrates or fractures the skull or another part of the head, which then directly affects the brain. So as far as the transition tip to the topic of the day, what we're, what, what I'm kind of pointing a kind of a spotlight on is the, the symptoms associated with dementia. Okay, MTBI, MTBI and TBI are familiar to those in the military community, but can that be said of service providers outside of the military community? How often do they encounter patients with occupations that put them at risk for possible injuries to the head regularly? and the potential for exposure for additional injuries of the same variety. So for those of you who know wounded warriors, have you noticed that some of them may exhibit some of these same symptoms that I've already named? You probably didn't associate those symptoms to dementia. Some of these might be associated to um, post-traumatic stress, um, other kind of transition challenges that have to do with emotions, and behavioral uh, transitions. So how do you address getting help for them when the patient isn't a senior, when they resemble senior-like symptoms? Okay, transition tips as far as what I've offered in the past, there's always communication that's required as far as really understanding what it is that's being observed and what it is that needs to be addressed as far as connections that might be offered. 
if you are observing these type of symptoms, these professionals on our panel, they're experts as far as recognizing what the symptoms are. Whether they're de being demonstrated by a service person who is not yet a senior or someone who is a senior. And as far as the services to address them, they, they know a lot of folks that may not necessarily um, provide the, the senior care services for the audience of a senior, but recognize that some of the care and uh, services available for those who aren't, they could be a good resource as well. All right. Ask for uh, clarification, ask for explanation, and just recognize that our experts today, they, they're expert at recognizing these kind of symptoms and have access to resources within the community that may be supportive, even if who the intended recipient isn't a senior. So recognize that. The Purple Connection is all about a community of organizations and business professionals who want to and can help expedite gaining a knowledge and access to resources and opportunities to be cognizant of what gaps you may have in what you know and have access to in the community and seek out the appropriate experts to help you. All right, we will move on to the next part of our program. If you're interested in continuing to participate it, more intentionally and facilitate a conversation on various, uh, various transition topics, I invite you to become a member of the American Warriors of the ACA Business Club. Becoming an American Warrior affords you with many benefits. You become a member of the club and you have access to any of the business club's facilities. Here in Greater Kansas City, we have five clubs. We have other clubs in other parts of the country and also clubs that are starting to form in um, places overseas. Being a club member, you have access to over 20 interest groups. The American Warriors is only one. You have the option to join a business development team and you have access to all of the organized and sponsored events of the club, whether they are virtual or in person. You have access to the members of the club through the directory, wherever they happen to be and that are live as well as virtual learning opportunities and networking opportunities every single week. There's also opportunities to step up into leadership for teams, groups, or various club locations based on your willingness or desire to be in a leadership role. The Purple Connection and Strengths Profile Workshops are sponsored, organized, and facilitated by Tubes Consulting. So American Warriors are encouraged to attend and invite guests to participate as often as they can. We are focused in supporting those in transition in our work. Other engagement opportunities for American Warriors and their guests are the monthly discussion roundtable, the semi-annual uh, social and guest speaker program, and then also stepping up to leadership within committees and um, uh, roles at the executive or the club level. For future American Warriors events, Next week is the American Warriors Dis Discussion Group. This is a hybrid event that can be attended in person at the Overland Park uh, Club or via Zoom. The topic of this month is planning. Uh, so there'll be some subtopics in the round table that uh, focus in on goals and metrics, uh, tactical planning, as well as strategic planning. The Intro to Strengths Profile Workshop is now on demand. Contact me if you or a group you represent um, is interested in learning about it and taking the assessment. And of course, there is the Purple Connection, which is a month from now. TPC Referrals is in a few weeks. This is an opportunity to intentionally connect with me and up to three others from the Purple Connection community on the mornings of October 11th and 12th. Participants introduce themselves, the connection or support that they need, and then ask for something specific in two rounds of, of uh, timed um, networking. Those on the call then respond to the asks for referrals, guidance, or opportunities. Invitations are um, sent out via email, and those who get invited are, in, are engaged in the military support community. They're growing their business, they're an American warrior or in transition, and they have a server leader mindset. So 
The invitations go out approximately two weeks in advance of the sessions with a calendar to where you sign up for your appointment times. And then you get a calendar link um, when you get signed up for a session um, so that you can join at the appropriate time. Next month, our Purple Connection lineup is uh, um, going to be on personal presentation. It's October 20th. Our veteran entrepreneur is Kirby Ingalls. He's a regional field missionary for fathers in the field. Our community organization representative is Edward Herman. He's the club president for the Northern Knights Toastmasters Club. And our military-friendly company representative, Reginald Ferguson. He is the owner as well being um, the primary fashion consultant and stylist for New York Fashion Geek. I will be providing the transition tips. So contact me at my email um, or phone number as you like. If you have more information um, requested on anything that's been mentioned in the program, any future events, you can connect with me on LinkedIn or feel free to request a free consultation if you need help in clarifying what steps you might need to take um, to be more intentional in your transition. Thank you everybody for being here. I hope that this was productive and beneficial for you. Have a very good evening and follow up with each other. I look forward to seeing you at a future event.